the Up End Movement and the first ever hybrid convening, Living Abolition Now, Exploring Everyday Resistance to Family Policing. We have, I don't know, maybe 100 people here in Houston live, and then we have many, many folks who are live streaming this event. Uh, and so together we're gonna share space, both virtually and in person. I am Kristen Weber. I am a senior director at the National Center for Youth Law. I also helped co-found UpEnd and remain as a senior advisor to the UpEnd movement. I'm very excited to be your host today. Just uh, a word or a reminder about UpEnd. UpEnd is a movement that is collaborative and works to abolish the existing child welfare system a system built on a model of surveillance and separation that is more accurately described as a family policing system. Abolition requires ending this oppressive system and, 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 don't we never wanna lose the and, and imagining and recreating the ways in which society supports children, families, their parents, and communities in being safe and thriving. When Up and launched in 2020, the initial collective work was just getting people to understand what we meant by abolition and helping this as a broader public conversation and really recognize the harms of family separation. Many of you in this room and also um, virtually have been with Up and from the beginning but for some of you, this might be your first time, and we welcome everyone. Today's convening, though, assumes that everyone has a basic understanding of abolition theory and thinking, abolition as dismantling harmful coercive systems, and remembering, imagining, and building care for families and communities. Now, for those of you who you are a beginner, there are many resources. Um, you can go to the Up End Movements website. We have a lot of resources there um, for folks in the room. Talk to other people here who know a lot about abolition. We also have a bookstore um, that's out in the back lobby area that has a lot of great books on abolition as well. Um, so, but. But we know that this, this is not a 101 or beginner session today. Uh, we know that many of you have been working and innovating and building for some time. And so today we wanted to be together and share ideas, strategies, successes, and setbacks. Most of this convening is moving beyond abolition as this abstract idea to highlighting the everyday work that is abolition. This is important. There's no single approach. There is no specific 72-point plan. It is all of us together, innovating, working together in community, challenging one another, thinking together with this goal of ending the harms of regulation, punishment, and surveillance, but also this goal of love, of caring for each other, for children and youth and their parents. If what you are experiencing at this convening makes an impact on you, you can make a gift to support the movement at upendmovement.org backslash donate. It's a way of paying it forward so that we can continue to reach abolitionists, activists, and leaders in the future. So, Today is gonna to be a whirlwind day with four live stream discussions, and we're gonna open this convening uh, with a conversation between Josie Duffy Rice and Alan Detloff. As many of you know, Alan Detloff is one of the co-founders of the Up End Movement and recently wrote a book examining the racist history of the child welfare system and laying out the case for abolition. Alan Detloff is a scholar, author, and abolitionist. He's also my friend. Uh, Alan began his career as a social worker in the family policing system, and today his work focuses on ending the harm that results from this system. He is author of Confronting the Racist Legacy of the American Child Welfare System, The Case for Abolition. His books, for those of you who are here, are in the way back. 
Uh, Josie Duffy Rice is a journalist, writer, law school graduate, and podcast host whose work is primarily focused on prosecutors, prisons, and other criminal justice issues. She is the host and co-writer of the podcast Unreformed, the story of the Alabama Industrial School for Negro Children released in January 2023. I have been listening to this on my morning walks. I highly recommend the podcast. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Josie and Alan. Hello, hello. Hi. 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 Morning, everyone. I'm very excited to be here um, and to be in conversation about this book, which I have been raving about. I loved it. I thought it was so great. And it's so good to see everybody here. Thank you for joining us. And thank you, Alan, for writing this book. Thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate being here. Um, OK, so let's jump into it. And I think the way we're going to do this is that we're going to kind of have two sections of questions. So we'll talk for about half an hour, open it up for questions. Then we'll talk for another half an hour, open it up for questions again. So we don't, you don't have to just listen to us nonstop for an hour. That sounds like torture, um, uh, at least me. Um, so uh, we're gonna, we'll, we'll start and then about 30 minutes we're gonna solicit questions. Are we gonna do mic or are we gonna write them down? Write them down. Okay, so we're actually gonna write questions down. That's all the information I have. And um, Jason. Jason knows more. I'm There's post-it notes on your desks. Post-it notes on your desks, yes. Okay. Um, and then Jason will pick them up and give them to us. So if you have questions, please, uh, we'd, everything's on the table. Also, if you're wondering why there is random little pieces of glitter on my face, it's because my daughter spilled glitter in my bag and then I touched my face. So that is why I'm covered and I wasn't out doing anything fun last night. I just have a three-year-old. So that's what we're working with today. Um, starting off on a high note. Okay, so. Um, Alan, I wanted to start with your scholarship and your work, which has traditionally been in social work, which as you point out in your book, is a, has historically been a pretty carceral field um, and has been deeply connected to our, our carceral system and our systems of family separation. Um, so I wanted to ask you just on a very fundamental level how you kind of came to abolition and how that, what price you've paid, if you've paid a price for kind of stepping out of the bounds of traditional social work understanding. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, as m many of you know, I started my career working in the child protective services system. I actually went into social work because I wanted to do that work. And when I started doing that work, I really thought that I was helping children and families. And that's the culture of the agency. I really, I, I think of it now as brainwashing of some sorts, as well as I think of a lot of social work education is brainwashing because it focuses solely on positive benefits of the profession without ever looking at the harm that the profession causes and the profession has caused for decades, since, it, since its earliest origins, going back to Jane Addams, who was very racist and nobody talks about. But the whole focus of the profession was about correcting behaviors, making people more like the elite white class to become productive members of society. Our whole profession is based on that. Um, but I, I believed that I was helping children and families. Um, and then for many years after I left the system, um, thought that I could reform the system. And, and again, thought I was doing good. And it really wasn't until I left the system and became involved in the state of Texas's work to address what the state calls racial disproportionality or the overrepresentation of children of color, mostly black children, that I really started to come to terms with um, the harm that the system causes and my complicity in that harm. You know, thinking back on the fact that not once ever did a child say to me, thank you so much for removing me from my abusive parents. It never happened. But when you're in the agency, you're in this culture of removal, the love that parents have for their children is never discussed, and removal is safety. That's the way the system makes you believe. 
Um, but e even with that, even with my understanding of the complicity of harm, because of this decades of brainwashing that I had been through in social work school, I thought that reform was the solution. I thought that reducing the number of black children in the system or reducing the impact of racism was the solution. And ultimately, and many of you have probably been in the situation where you realize you've been having the same conversations for, in my case, it was going on 20 years, and literally nothing ever changed. I think in 2020, there was a proposal for legislation in Texas where they wanted to create a new center to document the racial disparities in the system, which was exactly the same bill that I worked on in 2001 when I started working on the system. So 20 years later, nothing changes. They're proposing the same bills with no historical context that that's been proposed before. And, and it was then that I realized that reforms are just never going to work because in this system, reforms never address the fundamental harm of forcibly separating children from their families. And that's really when I came to the idea. I also had like simultaneously the opportunity of inviting Angela Davis to our campus to talk to our students and heard her talk about prison abolition. And it was really like just the dots started to be connected for me that we're all talking about the same thing. Um, and, and then as you mentioned, that led to I think a lot of good for the College of Social Work here. Um, you know, our enrollment grew by 30% when we took on this abolitionist identity and we had students from all over the country come here to learn about abolition work. But ultimately, the resistance to that abolitionist stance in social work at the university led to me being removed as dean of the college. And you know, the thing that it really was that you're probably not surprised about, it, it was about money. It was about the system felt threatened that they were going to lose their state contracts, particularly the state contracts that pay for students to get their master's degree and then force them to go work in this system for years because that's one of the only ways they have of populating their workforce. So they kind of prey on poor, mostly black and brown students and in their effort to diversify the workforce and then pay their tuition and then force them to go into the system. And they thought that our work would jeopardize those millions of dollars that the university receives for that. Mm -hmm. I knew, I was like, I'm writing down questions. I'm gonna have 30 follow-up questions for every answer. But um, I'm gonna come back to some of the things I'm thinking about because I think they'll be relevant later. But let's, let's stay on the topic of social work for a second. So given the history of the work, of the scholarship, of the job, of the role that social work plays in the child welfare system. What do you see as a future for this work in the world that you imagine, in, the, in an abolitionist future, where we dismantle the child welfare system as it, you know, as it exists, and you know, we remove the state from separating families, the ability to separate families? What does, what does social work look like? Um. It's a question I think about all, all the time because I mean, I'm involved in, in these spaces and, and do care about the future of social work. I think one, social work is at the place where it has to have a serious reckoning to get to the place where we want the profession to be. I think we're at a place right now where we have a younger generation of students that really want to understand abolitionist work, identify as abolitionist, want to be part of the movement to abolish prisons and policing and family policing, the child welfare system. But we have an elite, older guard of people who are running the profession, running spaces of higher education um, among the deans and directors of the profession that are not willing to provide students currently with what they're wanting. The students are going to win that battle eventually, but it's going to be a rough, a rough period while, while, that, while that battle is, is playing out. But I have a lot of hope for the future. I think so, when, when, the question's hard because when we think about social work now, I don't think that has anything to do with what the future of social work looks like. I don't think it's possible. And, and I should mention, you know, my, my friend who wrote a couple chapters in this book with me, Victoria Copeland, helped me really kind of think this through because she's a really deep thinker about this. Um, and always says that it's just not, the current version of social work is not possible to be an abolitionist. So there's not any such thing as abolitionist social work, really, because the profession is so deeply carceral. Um, but I do think there's a profession where something like a social work exists, where social workers really genuinely do work with families and with communities on building them up and providing 
or helping to provide the resources that people need um, until we really, in, in, in the interim period, until we get to the place that we all want to see where everyone has what they need. I think there's a role for social workers working with families and communities, provided there's no such thing as mandatory reporting laws and all of the other things that keep social work being carceral. So I think, there's a, I, I think there will always be a place for people who, with community and led by community, are assisting and playing a role in helping people access the resources and help they need. So the book kind of traces the history of the child welfare system and family separation and, and policy in America and how those two things separate and come together. So like you also talk about family separation outside of the context of child welfare. Um, and one of the ways in which you talk about it is slavery and um, what it meant to you know, take children from their parents to separate families. Um, in this context of racist capitalism and a, a, um, a system of enslavement, and you know, one of the things that you mentioned was that sometimes people had 30 minutes notice before they get separated from their child for the rest of their life, and what that did to families, and how that drove an interest in abolition. How this element of family separation is what kind of woke some people up to the harms of slavery. Can you talk a little bit about that history? Um, and I think. We were talking about this before, but I'm interested in how that relates to today, the relationship between abolishing prisons and police and what that, how that has driven people towards abolishing child welfare. So in some ways, it sort of seems like the opposite mm -hmm. direction. Yeah, I think, I think so. And I think that's a really good point that I hadn't really thought a lot about. But I think it is important. One, one of the goals of the book was to really connect the history of family separations in this country to the era of slavery over 400 years ago that, that is not talked about in, to the extent that it should be today. And to make the connections that the purpose of those family separations, maintaining the oppression of enslaved people, preventing a rebellion, is the same purpose of family separations that are done today by the child welfare system. But we tend to think about family separations as these historical, artifacts of time. Like most people know that children were separated from their, enslaved children were separated from their parents. Um, people may not know the extent of that, that it was up to two thirds of children experienced some form of separation being sold from their, sold from their parents. Um, but, but many of us know that that happened. We know that there's been other periods of family separations in this country's history. You know, indigenous children being separated and placed in Indian boarding schools. And then, of course, just recently, five years or so ago, at the U.S.-Mexico border, um, with Mexican, Mexican children and other Latinx children being separated from their parents at the border. I think the unique thing that I learned when I was researching this book is the extent to which, as you said, family separations really drove the abolitionist movement. It was underground abolitionist newspapers that were written by people in the South, shipped, to, shipped through these underground systems in the North. And it, with all of the horrors of slavery, it was just the visceral understanding of a mother or a father understanding what it would be like for a child to be taken from their arms, given away, sold away to strangers that brought white northerners on board to the abolition movement. So much so that it, that it said, this is an anecdote, um, Harriet Beecher Stowe's book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, this is actually an image on the cover of my book from Uncle Tom's Cabin, which featured several stories of family separations. And that was so important, why I wanted to put it on the cover is because um, Uncle Tom's Cabin was the second most sold book of the 1800s, second to the Bible. And it had such an impact on the abolition movement that when Abraham Lincoln met Harriet Beecher Stowe, he said, so you're the little lady who's responsible for this great war. That was how much he attributed the anger about family separations to leading to the Civil War. And I think you know, part of the goal of the book, part of the goal of uh, us as abolitionists in this movement is to somehow is recreate that, recreate the understanding of the horrors of family separation. And we know that's possible because we saw it five years ago. We saw it during zero tolerance. We saw protests around the country. So much, there was so much anger about family separation. There were psychiatrists, pediatricians all over the country writing letters saying that family separation is tantamount to torture. One quote from a pediatrician was, if you know anything about the research on this, we would never do it, meaning family separations. 
the entire zero tolerance policy removed about or separated about 3,000 children from their parents. The family policing system in the US removed over 3,000 children from their parents weekly in the United States. And we have to recreate that outrage, and that's what's still missing. I think, you know, thinking about your question, I think in a lot of ways it was an understanding of, it was the opposite. In, in 2020, we kind of saw the understanding of an abolition movement towards policing and the idea of defunding the police and reallocating resources and reinvesting in families and communities that brought attention to the parallel harms of the family policing system along with policing and prisons. But I, I still, and I, and I think that was important because it really did drive the movement and awareness of the movement, but I still think the movement has to somehow reach people who don't understand the harm of family separation and who also don't understand what we often talk about, which is the extent to which the system kind of operates under this myth of benevolence, where people think that the system is rescuing, saving children from egregious harm, when in reality, many of you in the room know more than 70% of children in foster care right now are there because of what the state calls neglect, which is poverty-related concerns. So there's literally, around the country, like weekly, there are situations where children are forcibly taken away from their mothers because their mother makes a decision to go to work and leave their child at home because they know if they made the decision to stay home with their child, they would be fired from their job, lose their income, be evicted, not be able to afford food. That's what we're taking children away from their parents now in this country. So we have to create that awareness that one, how harmful family separation is, but two, that the extent to which it's happening to people that that need other kinds of resources. The mom in that situation doesn't need her child taken away in parenting classes. She needs daycare. That's, that's, that's literally the solution to the entire problem. It's not like rocket science. Related to that point is this kind of um, understanding people have of language that they think is very objective and straightforward but is actually um, complicated and changes you know, generationally. So you talk about the definition of child abuse and the definition, as you just said, of neglect and how we imagine those to be very kind of, you hear these words and you associate them with a thing and then it turns out they're much, they're used much more expansively to, to the detriment, especially of black parents. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and also the cultural, the cultural and, and generational context of these terms. I mean, some of the things that we think of neglect now, like my parents thought like was just normal parenting when I was a kid. You, you know, you could stay home at age eight for a few hours and nobody would call the police on you. Um, or you could send your kid to the playground and nobody would call the police on you. And now it seems like um, as those terms evolve, parenting becomes a much more narrower prospect of what we can consider successful parenting or parenting that doesn't in, you know, require state intervention. Yeah, absolutely, and, and that's that's intentional on, on the part of the state. When when you really think about it, so like definitions of child abuse, definitions of neglect were set in the 1960s during the height of the civil rights movement in this country where we also saw horrific violence against black Americans, the lynching of Emmett Till, the assassination of Malcolm X, the violence against the Freedom Riders, the Selma Marchers, all of that. So there was this racial animus in the country related to perceived black advancement because of the civil rights movement. You also had publication of the Moynihan Report in 1965, which was very influential, which published one year after the Civil Rights Act, which essentially said that the Civil Rights Act is not going to help black Americans at all because it's not policies that are needed, that the problem in black families was the fact that most black families were led by single black mothers and the absence of a father figure would lead to a tangle of pathology. Um, his, his words were tangle of pathology that is going to lead to this underclass of black boys who grow up to be criminals. And, and we see these kind of tactics throughout history. We saw this when Hillary Clinton talked about super predators. We see this tactics where people try to scare white people about what's happening in black communities and the crime that's happening and how it's gonna impact them and mostly how it's gonna impact their property. That's what people get concerned about. Um, but all of that and then influenced these definitions of neglect. You can't separate the historical context from this time. So really everything we think about, child abuse, neglect, that was all developed by white elites who were responsible for 
developing legislation. So what you see then is the norm set as this white middle class parenting standard by which everything else is judged against. And now that's baked into all of our laws and policies. And it's even like the really insidious part is that in 1974 when the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, CAPTA, was passed, they intentionally created the term child maltreatment. And that was the first time that was in law, the term child maltreatment. And it was done on purpose to fold the terms of abuse and neglect into one category. So they would be viewed as the same. They're both child maltreatment, even though one is harm, one is about poverty, now it's all child maltreatment. And we saw immediately the impact on black families. We saw in 1962, when there were no mandatory reporting laws, only about 600 cases of severe child abuse were being reported to law enforcement nationally. By 1968, when every state had a mandatory reporting law, 11,000 reports were made, and 45% of those reports were about poverty-related concerns in black homes. That's how quick and severe the impact was on black families. But that was all intentionally designed to create this white standard that everyone else is judged against. And, and we saw it play out in reality. We saw almost half of all reports on black families. I'm gonna just, I'm, we're in a, just after this question, we'll move to audience questions, the first section of audience questions. So if you have them, raise your hand, raise them, your hand and Jason will pick them up. Okay. Um, one of the, thing, the points that I'm thinking about as you're talking uh, and was thinking about when re reading the book is that there seem to be these kind of two distinct ways in which the American government either facilitates or actively separates families. And one is this, um, you know, in the immigration context, in the slavery context, we are separating families, we know what we're doing, we're doing it to punish, right? And then one is, Benevolence. One is, this is not punishment, this is help. This is solving the problem. And like you said, there are lots of people who truly believe that what they're doing is helping families. You said that you kind of went on that own journey yourself. Can you talk about the like insidious role of this idea of benevolence that you mentioned earlier and how that um, shapes the way that people think about the role of child welfare? Yeah, that, that's such a good question and, and important to think about. And, and I think it really goes back to the history of this profession because it's really, there's family separations that are framed as benevolence, but it's all punishment. And the government knows it's all punishment and it was designed to be punishment since the very beginning. And it's all also based on both the history of social work and the history of the child welfare profession, which are undergirded by this philosophy of white saviorism. That there are white elites in society with resources that think that they can save children, rehabilitate children. Jane Addams' work in the settlement house movement was for the purpose of taking poor immigrant children and making them more American or more, um, more productive citizens. Um, the juvenile punishment started as a way of reform, reformatory movements, but it was actually a system of punishment because it very quickly, as soon as started, the child saving movement started focusing on mostly poor white or they might not have been racialized as white at that time, but poor European immigrant children, but very quickly evolved into a system of punishment where mostly black and brown children were in these reform schools. Your podcast is an excellent example of how policies like the black codes allowed these reform schools to basically be systems of torture with a, just another form of slavery. So it's all punishment. And, but what, that, what the philosophy of white saviorism does is it puts the focus on the individual by saying that these white saviors are going to fix, rescue these poor children from poverty, which comes with the assumption that there's something wrong about them or something wrong about their home or something wrong about their parents that they need to be rescued from, rather than the reality that what they need to be rescued from is government policies that maintain their, po their poverty. I think it's like timely right now, there was just a report that came out a few weeks ago about the child tax credit when that was extended in 2021 due to COVID. And when that was extended, we saw child poverty in the United States in 2021 go down, decrease from 9.7% to 5.2%. So like almost in half, like almost from 10 to five. In 2022, when that extension ended, it went up to 12.4%. So child poverty now, 
is more higher than it was pre-COVID. But what that shows us is the government literally knows exactly how to solve child poverty and has all of the money to do yes. so. They just intentionally choose not to. It's not rocket science. Like it's right there. We know how to do it. But they want to keep our attention on blaming individuals and fixing their problems. And the elimination of a tax credit like that will literally lead to children being separated from their parents. I mean, that Absolutely. actually will lead Poverty to is worse now. Right, mm -hmm. right. Um, okay, we're gonna do questions, um, but I just wanted to ask you one last question for our first section, which is, we all in this room, thank you so much, know about what the response you get when you talk about abolition of prisons and, and um, you know, abolition of the punishment system. You hear, what about rapists? What about murderers? You just, you know, you think, what, what are you gonna do about the really, terrible crimes, and we've all had to answer that question plenty of times, I'm sure. I could, if I had a nickel, <laughs> um, I would have a couple dollars at least. Um, uh, but um, I, I wanted to ask how you respond to that when people say, well, what about children who are being sexually abused? What about children who, you know, are going through the worst possible stuff at home? They do not have, um, you know, the resources to, to, to get out on their own. They need this system to address what they're going through. How do you respond to that? Yeah, it, it's, it's a hard question because we're thinking about it in the context of now, before we've created the world we wish to see, when people have all of the resources that they need to live safely in their homes and in their communities. And, and we know, again, that just a small amount of direct material assistance to families significantly reduces not only neglect issues, but issues of harm as well, and contact with child welfare systems. But I think I always try to start that question with what we, with the, the question of what would, should we do with children who are harmed with what we know about what we shouldn't do. And we know we shouldn't respond in ways that cause further harm. And we know from decades of research, this is not in dispute, that family separation causes immense trauma harm. Placement in foster care leads to horrific outcomes of not just poverty, but homelessness, substance abuse, greater likelihood of being involved in the criminal punishment system. All of the conditions that maintain the oppression of black and brown people, foster care literally causes. So we know we shouldn't do that. I think, you know, I, I, I try to stay away from like, this is the solution or this is the 10 point plan. I think what I usually say is to ask people to think about their families, their network of people that they love and care about, and imagine that a child in that family is harmed. What would you want to happen? Would you want to get together as a family and community of people who love and care about each other and figure out how to protect that child from future harm? Or would you want the government to take the child away from you, not knowing where it is, with who, what's going to happen, and if you'll ever see that child again? I think you, when given that choice, most people would choose the first option. And if you want that option for yourself, we have to get to the place in society where we trust other families that they should have that option for them too. We can't just say, well, my family could do it, but everybody else's can't. If you want that for yourself, you should want that for every family. And if you want that option for every family, then you're an abolitionist. Um, okay, so questions from the audience. The first is, what is your analysis of Texas's current push to move CPS functions to quote community-based care? They love to say community-based care. Why? That's like their favorite phrase. Does this um, does this move us towards abolition, or what? What is this? What does this mean for us? No. no. Community-based care is like like most things, like most reforms that the system comes up with. They're designed to trick you. With they're designed to trick you with like a a, a term that sounds good. You know, it's like, like the system talks about racial equity and they want to achieve racial equity, which literally just means hundreds of thousands of children are still taken away from their parents. They're just proportioned equitably by race. That shouldn't be the goal for, for anybody, but it sounds good. So you have you know, Asia Schomburg, the commissioner, all over you're talking about racial equity. Community-based care is not really community-based care. It means they're just farming some of their money out to community agencies. So instead of their workforce supervising your children in care, it's a community organization 
foundation who's getting millions of dollars from them to surveil you and supervise your children and care. It's not. It, it's an example of co-opting that I know our communications panel after lunch is going to talk about, where they take words that we've, we've developed as organizers and they use them for their own purposes to, to trick people. So when we talk about like communities caring for their children and families, all of a sudden the system's doing community-based care. But the two things have absolutely nothing to do with each other. So, um, sorry, I'm looking, I wanna know where I wanna do this in. Okay, how, this is, I love this question. What should we continue to think and learn and explore about to ensure that this movement doesn't mimic oppressive, hierarchical, white dominant, other um, structures and ways that we see in kind of the opposite spaces? Yeah, gosh, that's an important question. I, you know, I think the importance is, I, I think about it from, two ways. You know, people often ask like why why I wrote a book about black families in the child welfare system. Um, whereas, you know, I I'm Mexican American, I identify as gay. I could have written a book about like things that I know more from a, a personal ex a, like a personal place versus like my professional experience. To me, I think it's it's important in any movement that you focus on the people who that the focus is always on the people who are most harmed by the movement. And in this system, the focus has to stay on black families because of that. I, I wouldn't criticize other people who think about it differently. I would never write a book about Latinx families who are impacted by the system or LGBT families who are impacted by the system, even though I know that they are, but that may, takes the focus off of the group who's most severely impacted. So I think it, the movement always needs to be led with, with that idea, because we know when we focus who, on the people who are most harmed, we're also helping everybody behind them who is, who is also being harmed and oppressed by the system. And then of course I think that the movement needs to be led by people, by the people who have been most impacted by the system. Upend is just a small part of this movement, and I think we have an important space in the sense that we've been able to reach academic spaces and social work students in ways that some other like arms of the movement don't have those connections, and that mostly just became, came, came from my position and the privilege I had when I was dean of a school of social work. So I think there's roles for all of those spaces, but ultimately knowing that the movement is led by the people who are have been most impacted by the system. But that it also takes people like me who are complicit in harm talking about the harm that we cause people because the movement can't be just driven by expecting people to share their experiences of harm. Those of us who did the harm are the ones that need to be expected to talk about it. Can you speak about why, as social workers, especially those working with families, there should be involvement and care about Palestinian liberation and liberation from colonial occupation systems at large? I think it's really for, important for social work to be involved in that work. Liberation is liberation. We can't have a movement that only focuses on liberation of the child welfare system without a movement that's connected to the other forms of, of oppression that happen domestically and internationally. You know, Ruth Wilson Gilmore also says that abolition needs to be red, green, and international. Red meaning involving some form of socialism, green in meaning paying attention to the oppression of the earth by man-made policies, and then international by being focused on liberating people who are oppressed in other parts of the country. If we free the United States from oppression, but there are still countries who are occupied, enslaved, tortured, terrorized, the, the movement is not successful. It, it's, all, it's all the same movement, and absolutely, social workers, all, all of us need to be involved in that movement. Okay, keep, keep the questions coming, raise your hand, and um, they'll get picked up, um, and then we will do another session of us talking, and then we will uh, read more questions. So these were great, we'd love to hear more. Um, can we talk a little bit about the media's role in the perpetuation of this harmful child welfare system? I'm thinking in particular of the stories 
when you hear about, when you, the idea that, the, that media has of child welfare failing is something happens to a child who they should have been watching mm -hmm. and therefore they need to become more vigilant. They, you know, um, and there's sort of a sense of risk reduction mm -hmm. that actually probably perpetuates harm. Um, yes. I'd love to hear you talk about how the media has been kind of complicit in driving the harms of the system. Yeah, I, I think about that a, a lot in trying to think about this, how to build a, a, a strategy for this movement where people come to understand the harms of the system in the same way they understood the harms of family separation during slavery or the harms of family separation when they happened during zero tolerance. And I think in large part that myth of benevolence has been created by the media. When there are severe cases of child abuse, and they do happen, they're an incredibly small, less than 1% of the cases that the system deals with, but they do happen. But then those stories are deemed newsworthy, and the local news goes out to that house, and they talk about how the children are saved or rescued, and that creates the impression for people who don't know that that's what the system is doing all the time, rescuing children from these horrific abusive situations when we know that that's not what's happening at all. So that's part of the media's complicity. But then the other part that, that you mentioned is, I, I think we see it with cops too. Crime goes up and the solution is that we need more cops. Um, a case happens in the child welfare system where a child is known to the system somehow and then, and then dies or experiences some another form of really extreme maltreatment. The solution is, the child welfare workforce is overworked, they have a turnover problem, we need more money to go to the system, we need more caseworkers. When that, when that just distracts from the real factors that are driving people into the system. When violence is inflicted on a community for decades, if not centuries, then we're going to see violence happen within that community. Um, when poverty is intentionally inflicted on communities by the laws and policies of the government, then we're going to see things happen within homes and communities that drive the police to them, that drive child welfare agencies to them. But the solution is never more of the thing that causes harm. The solution is always, or always needs to be, providing the resources that we know address the underlying issues. It's not cops, it's not caseworkers that keep us safe. What keep us safe, keeps us safe is well-funded public schools, jobs, access to healthcare, access to substance use services for anyone who wants or needs them, access to mental health services. That's what creates safety. But the media doesn't say that. The media says we need more of, of this thing that we know causes harm. Um, let's talk about juvenile punishment and the child welfare system and this idea that children, delinquent children, the answer to, to, to delinquency, I'm, if you can't see me, I am using a lot of quotes right now, a lot of finger quotes, um, is taking kids away from their parents. So this, uh, this school that I focused on in, in my podcast, Mount Meg's, one of the things that really stuck with me was how many parents never knew what happened to their children. They just, children got arrested, taken away in the middle of the night, and they don't, just never knew. And the language that the state used was, well, you weren't able to parent your child, and so now we have to take them. You see it in the truancy context, you see it kind of in any way that we talk about dealing with child delinquency, it always involves taking a child away from their parents. Mm -hmm. Just talk, yeah, just wanna hear your thoughts. Yeah, you know, what's really, what's really interesting about that is how intentional the government was in ensuring that those family separations could continue after slavery was, in, in theory, abolished, or after, after emancipation through the 13th Amendment, with, with the Black Codes. Black Codes, it, immediately following 13th Amendment, Black Codes were passed that essentially looked to recreate a system of slavery by making, setting, setting laws where things that were formerly misdemeanors were felonies only if they were done by a black person. Um, that made it ag against the law to be homeless or really expanded these vagrancy laws for the purpose of mass incarceration of formerly enslaved people in order to recreate a system of forced labor through convict leasing that the 13th Amendment allowed. 
But we also saw that happen with children. And I think with that hasn't gotten enough attention. I think Dorothy Roberts brought a lot of attention to that in Torn Apart, where she talked about how the Black Codes also created these systems of forced apprenticeships for children um, who were often apprenticed, forced, put into forced apprenticeship models with their former enslavers. And all the state had to do was prove that their parents were somehow unfit. So it's this idea of unfitness that has been used by the state since abolition of slavery to take children and mostly black children away from their parents. Um, and but then we also saw that in the foundations of the juvenile punishment system that started in, in theory as the system of reform or benevolence, but very quickly turned into a system of punishment as more and more black children came involved in the system. Because similar to the child saving movement that was on the Jane Addams side, the racism of the child savers who started the juvenile punishment system, the child welfare system, was so deep that they just believed fundamentally that black children were not redeemable. That even if they were given the services that white children were given through these reform schools, they just wouldn't be able to pick it up because they were just fundamentally not redeemable. So that's when we saw these systems shift from allegedly about reforming into something a, a better citizen into just systems of reform and punishment. But in every instance of these cases, it's been children who are forcibly separated from their parents. And I think when, when we really look at that history, it's important to point out too, there's never been a period of our history where white children have been forcibly separated by the government from their parents. It's consistently and over time, black children, indigenous children, Latinx children. And so we have to start looking at family separations as not historical incidents, but a continuum, a, a continual tool used by the state for 400 years to maintain oppression. One of the, one of the um, I think, really powerful points in your book is this relationship between technology, surveillance, AI, and, um, and child welfare system, and how the potential for this to get so much worse um, is, is there given what we're seeing with um, how surveillance has exploded in all sorts of ways that you know, the average person doesn't even maybe recognize. Can you talk a little bit about what the past two decades, let's say, of, um, of increased technology and increased kind of government surveillance um, has meant for child welfare and how predictive surveillance as well, what that means? Yeah, first, uh, let, me, let me again shout out Victoria Copeland, who helped me understand a lot of this and wrote the chapter with, with me about this. If you haven't read Victoria's dissertation, it, it's available through like the university's library and it's brilliant because she really talks about how deep the surveillance state is in child welfare. And let me quickly, while I'm thinking of, give a shout out to the other people who helped write some chapters in the book because lots of them are here. Kristen Weber, Maya Pendleton, Jesse Hartley, and Reiko Boyd. They all contributed in different ways to the book. But Victoria is a really deep thinker about AI issues in, in the child welfare system, per particularly predictive analytics, which I think has been on the, on the horizon of family policing systems for maybe a decade now, but systems are really moving to rapidly expand that. And what's really insidious about predictive analytics is that <clears throat> they're sold to the public and to the system as a way of reducing bias. Because if the problem is human decision making or human error, <clears throat> first I think it's important to point out that any time a system needs to adopt some kind of tool that's going to help them reduce bias from human decision making, it just proves how horribly racist the system is, that they literally can't rely on their workforce to make decisions. <clears throat> But we also know that predictive analytics specifically has been proven to just increase the racism and increase the bias and increase the disparities that we see. But because nobody really understands what predictive analytics does, because you have this small group of white professors, most of them social workers, social work professors, who have developed these tools and really talk about the fancy statistics that are behind them. There was, there was literally a story, I think it was one that Roxana Asgarian wrote a, a while back about predictive analytics, where she had a quote from a supervisor in a family policing agency say, yeah, you know, we don't really understand the science behind that. We just know that they say it works. That's the level of depth that's in the system about their understanding of these tools. But 
it shows what reforms do. It sounds good, and we know that there's these fancy statistics behind it. So even though predictive analytics, particularly the Allegheny tool, has been, which lots of other counties and jurisdictions are trying to adopt, has been thoroughly debunked, other states are rushing to adopt it because they know that it basically pacifies legislators who are on their back or people in the public. They say, you have these racist outcomes and they say, oh, but we're using predictive analytics right now and let me bring in this expert to tell you everything that predictive analytics does, even though we know that it doesn't work. Can you, I, one of the things that we were talking about before we came up here was the relationship between the child welfare system and the reproductive health movement and the bodily autonomy movement, what it means, um, how, how the kind of increased restrictions on abortion um, and also the relationship to policing of gender and sexuality, um, how that is only gonna exacerbate the harms we're seeing in this system. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, it's so multifaceted. And first, I'll give another shout out to Maya because Maya's in the room, and I know Maya's writing a brilliant paper um, about the relationship between the reproductive justice movement and the family policing. You you can't really talk about abolition of family policing or the family policing movement without talking about the reproductive justice movement, because the movements are tied in the sense that they're connected to the idea of autonomy over when to parent, how to parent, with whom to parent, um, whether to parent, all of those questions are fundamentally tied to, to both issues. Um, and I think when the restrictions that we see right now are, are not going to drive more children into poverty, but we also see particularly coming, say, from the Supreme Court, this really horrific narrative about adoption. And I think it's important that we also connect the movements to end abolish adoption to the movement to abolish family policing. Because the idea that we don't need um, access to abortions because of baby Moses laws and things like that, because you could just bring your baby to a, to a hospital or a police station and some nice family will want to adopt it, is, is just horrifying and should you know, terrify all of us. But that's, that's the rationale that's being used without any connection to the idea of all of the stories of trauma we know from adoptees, the trauma that parents go through, the challenge of carrying a baby to term for pregnant people and the risks that come with that. But all, all of that is connected and is only going to result in more harm and more harm to poor, mostly black and brown families. One of the, um, I was gonna bring up the, the adoption conversation because I, I see that that is a place where there is the most pushback that I, that from my perspective. And part of that I think is, is a very reasonable interest or, or understanding that ha that the ability to have children is very is limited to certain to certain people at certain times and not everybody has access right to to biological to have biological children and so what do what do we do you know like if you want to be a parent and you don't have um, you you're not able to have biological children for whatever reason what what is the answer what do you how do you respond I mean that to me feels like a much even, re receives a lot even more pushback than talking about abolishing the child welfare system. So I wonder how you navigate that conversation. Yeah, well, well first I would, I would give credit to everything I've learned from people who've been adopted. Every, everything I know about this, this work and this movement I've learned from people who have experienced the harm of adoption who have ed educated me about that. And so I, I think what many of those people would say to many people who've, who've, who've been adopted um, and have been harmed and traumatized by that would say to the question of what do people do who can't have children is that the answer is not ever that if you can't have children then you then deserve the right to someone else's child. <laughs> and and, and adoption is based on this narrative that people are deserving of that, that they're deserving of other people's 
children because they can't have their own. And, and of course, then the narrative that adoption is this beautiful, wonderful process for everyone involved. And just the stigma that comes to many people who I know have been, have been adopted who feel like they can't even talk about the harm. They're only supposed to be grateful that they were adopted. So I think like the harms there are complex in, in some similar ways to family policing work, but in some very different and unique ways too. Okay, I'm calling a slight audible. Is that how you say it? Yes. Hail Mary? I don't know. Something about football, I think. Um, and I think, because we have a lot of questions, so I think we should go to questions now and then we'll end on some of the, um, the future thinking. Um, so uh, these are really great questions, everybody, by the way. Um, so uh, one of the questions is about language. How do we use, what language do we use in response to child first proposals? For family separation and this idea that people who are part of this system are may, are primarily concerned with children and therefore you we must that, that therefore they kind of have a monopoly on this sort of child first language i i, I don't I, I, th I think it's a hard question because the, the language and the terms that like the reformers and the white saviors kind of grasp onto change change quickly I think we do have to have a conversation in this movement about like the broader role of children's rights and children's advocacy and the voice that children have in what happens to them and their outcomes and with whom they live that I don't think the system or even our movement is really grappling enough with yet that I think we have to start thinking more about that. We're accused often of like only focusing on parents rights to detriment of children. Um, that's not the case at all. I always say you know, abolitionists are the people who are concerned, really concerned about children's safety because we don't want children to be taken from their parents and then harmed by the foster care system where we know that rates of abuse are two to three times higher in foster systems than in the general public. So I think we just have to be kind of aware of how all of these terms are being co-opted by the movement who's doing that intentionally to distract us from the work. Mm -hmm. Do you have advice for a former foster youth who's trying to work within the system and be a caring social worker, how to kind of navigate this from an abolitionist perspective? Yeah, that's, that's such a hard question too. I, I really, I try to stay away from giving advice about what individual people should do in their, in their careers, because I, I just don't have the authority to do that. And there are lots of reasons why people go into work in certain systems, and then particularly reasons why people are not able to leave systems that they're working in that they might otherwise want to for different reasons. I think what I try to think of is that, uh, that, the, that, this is, that this system, as many systems, are not about good or bad individuals in the system. The problem is the system. The problem isn't, as I know Maya wrote in the book, the problem isn't that the child welfare system needs a more diverse workforce, need more people involved to have lived experience, need better assessment tools, better training. The problem is that the child welfare system has was been built on the idea of harming and maintaining the oppression of black families, and it does so exceptionally well. That's the problem of the system, not individual workers. So I think when it comes to individual workers, there's, I would say you think about the reasons you got into social work, if, if that's your profession. Think about the reasons you went to work in the system, which are usually because you thought you would be helping, helping children, helping families in some sense. And then look around you and see if that's really what's happening at the agency. Are children and families really being helped? I think as social workers, that's something we need to constantly be thinking about and, and recognize that this system in particular is so big. Like we tend to focus on, I'm helping these children on my caseload, but that's not impacting any of the broader harms that are happening in the system. And, and I, I've come to the place where I think about it as social workers have been tricked e either by our, ourselves or by other people to believe that we can create change from the inside. Whereas 
I think the whole concept of change by the inside has been created by white people to get us to stay in their systems of harm and keep perpetuating the outcomes that these systems have because it just doesn't work. So it's okay, I'd say, like for the whole profession of social work to say, you know, we tried. We worked in the system for going on 60 years now. We tried to make things better and it didn't work. Now we need to get out of the system and try and, and work towards ending the system from the outside. Okay, I know you just said you try to stay away from advice, but there are a couple advice questions. So you, you can stay away after we are done, but up until then you gotta, yeah. Um, which one question is about advice for registered foster parents. Uh, you know, people who want to provide, given that this is what we have, I wanna provide a home for these, for these children, but I also recognize, like you said, there's a relationship between what I'm doing and perpetuating a system that I think causes harm. I, th I think the important thing for a, a foster parent is to understand that the sole purpose of that role is for you to work with the family to get that child returned to their family as soon as possible. That's the, the, that's the role of a foster parent. What, what's happened is we've gotten to this place with foster to adopt policies where people get into fostering because they want to adopt other people's children. So you have a lot of people who get involved in the system not because they want to help, because, but because they want to adopt someone else's children. Until we get to the point where we're significantly reducing family separations and the children who are in care, the foster parents that are in the population now, their sole purpose should be to get those children back to their homes as soon as possible. And then to work as part of the broader movement to end, end the need for this thing called foster parenting, which is a horrific invention that we, we shouldn't have. So much of this work is about, it's not just about ending the child welfare system, it's about making the need for the child welfare system obsolete. Right. And when the child, and that, includes making the need for a foster parent that's paid by the state obsolete. Right, the sense that we, which is the tradition and the American way, right, that we fail at something and instead of solving the failure, we create a new thing that's supposed to band-aid the failure right. that we made instead of stopping the and failure. And gives, we give strangers money to right. take care of other people's children right. instead of giving the people who need the money the, right. the money. I wanted to say, because I, um, I called it Audible Hail Mary or whatever a client now. That that meant maybe some people had questions that they didn't yet turn in. If you have questions, you can still turn them in and I can still ask them. Um, so it doesn't have to just be these. Because um, I would love to hear more of what you guys are thinking. You have great ones. Um, there is a question uh, for me, which I don't know that I'm going to be able to do this justice, but I do think it's an interesting question about mobilizing movement infrastructure around mass incarceration when it comes to the child welfare system. Someone made the point that much of public defense pu perpetuates narratives about child abuse and neglect, which I think is um, which I think is really smart. I hadn't I hadn't really thought that through, and but it is definitely true that when you have an individual client, the way in which you're framing their history and their lives is not always going to be the way in which you want the system to look or because you're advocating for one person versus trying to, and this kind of goes back to, to the inside game um, and what it means to be part of a system that you know, is causing harm. One thing I would say about that is that there are some innovative offices that provide help around all of these issues. So they provide public defense help, but they also, um, I'm thinking about I, uh, Bronx Defenders and Brooklyn, I think, as well, have what they call holistic um, public defense, which, depending on what office you are in, could mean you either have pe family, family attorneys who represent children or family attorneys who represent parents. I think the offices that represent parents um, are doing something pretty innovative and have been criticized a lot for it, but it is very important. Um, the idea of representing parents in child neglect hearings is very controversial, obviously, for the reasons that we know, but, um, but spaces where if you are facing um, you know, a family court or a family law issue as well, because of your criminal conviction or, or immigration issue, you can get help for them all in one place. Um, so that's not really a full answer to the like, what do we do about the narratives in these spaces? But I think it is, it is a way in which public defense is trying to account for all the different harms of the criminal system. Um, and then how do we, 
I think this is, I think this one's for both of us, which is how do we build cohesive narratives across these movements? So there's family separation, there's immigration, there's mass incarceration, there's education, I think there's juvenile justice. There are sort of all of these very interconnected issues that often work siloed um, and are building their own kind of narrative um, direction. How do you, what do you think about in terms of how we kind of connect those all through, through narrative building? Yeah, I think, I think there's a couple ways to do that. And, and I think I've really seen that improve in, say, the last three, three years, three, three or four years, in terms of the con understanding the connections between the movement. One is focusing on the, on the history, the history of these systems, because all of the systems started really from the same ideology, the ideology of white saviorism, the ideology that these systems were needed to recreate, basically recreate a system of slavery in this country through this punishment model. Um, and, and then I also think, you know, we, we talk about carceral logic a lot, and sometimes that sounds kind of fancy or hard, like, like, a, like a big word, but, but I think the more we can talk about that in ways that helps people understand what, what we mean by carceral logic, because it's that, that to me is the connective thread, the, the logic that undergirds these systems, which is essentially the idea that individuals are responsible for their problems and particularly their poverty. And when an individual is in need of help, in order to get that help, they have to be punished in some way to get it. And then the services that are allegedly designed to help them have to come along with some kind of punishment to, to basically show them that it was them, that it was their, their, that it was their fault, and that in order to get these services, you also need to be punished a little bit to get, to get this thing that's going to help you. And that whole model of that is designed to distract us from the reality that poverty is a societal problem, not an individual problem. Really, society, poverty is a societal failure that, like we talked about before, the government knows exactly how to solve and chooses not to. Because the government knows that if it were to solve poverty, then it wouldn't have an exploitable labor class to depend on, which is what's needed to keep this system of racial capitalism and capitalist accumulation going. So the government chooses not to solve poverty and then creates these distractions for us to think that it's individuals who are doing it to themselves or communities doing it to themselves within their communities. That's the logic that undergirds all of this. And it's really like the logic that we need to be abolishing that uh, keeps props these systems up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm trying to make, you're saying so many things, so I'm trying to make notes as I'm, <laughs> as I'm doing this uh, because I, um, I think that's just such a good point. Uh, there's a great question about ICWA, which is like, what, do, what does ICWA t teach us about keeping families together and cultural preservation? Um, you know, this has been kind of the main child welfare topic, at least in the mm -hmm. law, um, over the past couple of years, I would say, uh, in terms of the media and the Supreme Court and where, what, what do you think the lesson there is? ICWA's tricky in the sense that I, there's, there's a lot of good in ICWA and the intents behind ICWA, the Indian Child Welfare Act. Um, I think what ICWA teaches us, like the first thing that comes to my mind when I think of what ICWA teaches us is about how the federal government can take a policy that's designed to be good and turn it into something that just maintains destruction of families. Because none of the outcomes that ICWA was, we were supposed to realize through ICWA are happening. I mean, indigenous families are severely impacted by the system. I mean, in, in a lot of ways, in, in some ways more so than, than black families, when you really look at like percentages, in, indigenous children are represented in the system at a rate more than double their proportion of the general population. They're just such a small amount in the system that it doesn't get the, the attention or it doesn't get like the media narrative that um, black, black families deservingly get because of the large impact, but they're really severely impacted by the system. So I think there's some, you know, there's good aspects to ICWA that I think we could look at as a like, non-reformist reforms if they were adopted, things like active efforts, which go much further than the current standard, which is reasonable efforts. But I think re really the lesson to ICWA is that there is no policy that we could come up with 
that's designed to reduce the involvement of children in the system that the federal government and the states won't figure out how to manipulate to maintain their power mechanism. This is a question about CAPTA. CAPTA provides millions of, flexible, millions of dollars of flexible funding to states to support families, including income supports. How can this support be preserved and separated from the other aspects? I'm not an expert in child welfare or funding. I know that we have people in the room are, um, people who are there, lots of people, um, Angela, I mean many people who are involved in the repeal CAPTA movement who have that expertise. I, th I think the issue is when it comes down to funding is that it, it's not about CAPTA funding or, or this other bucket of funding. It's about all of the funding. All of the funding right now is being redirected in various ways to services or allegedly services that the government wants us to think are helpful, but they're not. They're just, at the end of the day, they're fundamentally propping up the system and the system's ability to surveil and punish families. Every dollar that's inside somehow the child welfare system, whether it's allocated through CAPTA or through ASFA or like now through Families First, which we know has done nothing to really prevent child abuse, all of that money needs to be directed outside of the system to families, to communities, and then those families and communities need to have the power to decide how that money's going to be used. We shouldn't want to preserve any money that's currently allocated to systems of harm. It all needs to go away. And there's another question. Um, I think this might be our last one. So if you have more, you guys should feel free to send them in. But there's another question about narrative, um, which is about terms like child welfare, protection, maltreatment. I mean, you were talking about a little bit of this before, but these are really powerful. I mean, when people hear these terms, they, they think of them as non-negotiable mm -hmm. um, and um, not really arguable that these are good things or bad things. How do we um, complicate or challenge some of these these terms when we think about them. Yeah, we, we need to disrupt them. I mean, that, that's the reason why at Upend we use the term family policing system. Again, I'll give a shout out to the origins of that term. Family policing system was, that term was developed by two doctoral students, Victoria Copeland and Brianna Harvey, who were students of Dorothy Roberts, who was working on their dissertation, who kind of in conversation collectively came up with that term that many of us use right now. Um, and I think it's important that we use that term because we know that child welfare system is the term given to us by the state to trick us into thinking they care about children's welfare. Foster care is a term given by the state. Child protection, those are all terms that help create the myth of benevolence that we need to very actively reject. Um, I think there's still some work for, for the, the, the movement to really coalesce around terms, um, because I still hear other, I hear other terms, and I think it would, it's, it's helpful to a movement to have a, a term. Um, but I think we need to just generally be pushing back on any of the narratives that try to frame this system as good. There's another social work school that puts out a newsletter periodically called The Good Stuff in Child Welfare. Um, that recently focused, if you, if you get Richard Wexler's um, blog from NCCPR, their, their recent story focused on the children that the system is giving, that the system is giving children free haircuts. So you get taken from your, away from your parents and then the positive, the good stuff in child welfare is that you're getting free haircuts. But that's the kind of narratives that are out there. Um, and the system, as I know, as you've probably all seen, does panel presentations where they put impacted people on those panels to talk about all of their accomplishments. And there are many accomplishments that many people who've been impacted by the system have achieved. But the system never talks about the reality that they should have been able to achieve all of those things without ever having any contact with the system. 
And then even like for those here in academic spaces or watching in, in academic spaces, there continues to be research proliferating the social work research that focuses on the positive outcomes of foster care um, and positive benefits from foster care. And we need to disrupt that. We need to stop those, those narratives from getting out there. That's perpetuated by journal editors and reviewers who are actively rejecting the things that we publish. Um, but we have to start pushing, like I literally started my own journal because of that for, for social workers who write abolitionist stuff, abolitionist perspectives in social work. Because all of the doctoral students that I was working with, their articles were getting rejected. Or reviewers were coming back with, some, if they would say something like, the child welfare system is based on historical racism, they would want them to cite that. There's in like, APA publishing and citations, there's what's called the public knowledge exception. If something's common knowledge, you don't have to cite it. The fact of this country being founded on white supremacy doesn't need to be cited. That's common knowledge. The child welfare system being undergirded in racism, that's common knowledge. It doesn't need a citation. But we still have journal editors, reviewers who are pushing that. We need to challenge that and disrupt it. Related to that, this idea of evidence-based practices from an abolitionist perspective, like this is what we kind of view as legitimate research, legitimate evidence. Um, how do you, yeah, talk about what, that, what, what you think about evidence-based practices from this perspective, from this frame. I think the, the professions, social work particularly, because that's what I'm most connected to in these narratives, but I think others too are at kind of this critical place where there's been a lot of pushback about this notion of evidence-based because evidence-based is, the idea of evidence-based is largely based around the idea of a very narrow kind of evidence. Evidence that comes from large national quantitative data sets that people are, able to manipulate statistically. And, and really, when you start to do that, you could come up with any finding that you want, depending on what variables you put in these statistical models. Um, but that's historically been given the gold standard of what research is. Um, if you read any article about racial disproportionality, all these journal articles have to have what's called a literature review where you kind of sum up the issue, you'll only see uh, stories or citations from quantitative journal articles because what, that's what people have been led to believe the evidence is. So the one, there's a complicity in PhD schools that are educating the next generation of researchers and not talking more about the importance of qualitative work. Um, but I, I think there's pushback now about that, but we need to continue that, particularly people in academic spaces. It's the voices of people who have been harmed by the system that are the evidence we need to know that the system needs to be abolished. When a mother of color, when a black mother, tells us about the racism that she's experienced in the system, that's evidence. That's evidence and we need to believe her and we need to act about that. We don't need statistics for that. So that was a question I had which was about who gets to tell their story. And this is a major, um, what I found very difficult in working on this project in this Alabama Justice uh, Juvenile Reformatory was just how little few records we have and how difficult it is to find out how the actual students felt. You have maybe records of the parents or the teachers and records of the state. You don't actually have records of the students. And it feels like that's particularly, um, that's exacerbated in any sort of system that includes children because we're very good at talking about what children should want and need without actually hearing from children. Can you talk a little bit about what kind of infrastructure around, um, around you know, personal experience, personal narratives, personal records we need to ensure that we're ha we create a better system and that children are, real different stories are, are told? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think that's a complicated question because there is, is an issue of, of, of trauma and re-traumatization every time that someone who's been impacted talks about this. Mm -hmm. So I think there has to be space to think through, um, one, the idea that no one should feel compelled to share their story, um, but also that there are means to do that 
to share stories and create these records that don't involve a traditional research process. You know, whether that be like through a, a blog post, um, a, a video that someone creates for like a TikTok video that someone creates about those need to be the evidence that we start using because I think there's a lot of harm that can come through the formal research process. Um, but it, it's more about shifting the narrative about what, what is the record or, or like a podcast where, where someone like you shares these stories. Um, Roxana's book, We Were Once a Family, which was a, a journalistic account mm -hmm. that shared all of these stories that is now part of the record. Right. That needs to be the evidence of the future that we're using. The problem right now is in a lot of still academic spaces, if an academic cites your podcast some reviewer will have a, an issue with that, that that's not evidence. Mm -hmm. And so that's really the narrative that we have to start shifting. Mm -hmm. and, and again, it's, it's, it's up to institutions of higher education, which are horribly racist and violent to start with. I and mean, so there's like it, immense changes that need to happen there, but that's really where the complicity starts right now. Mm -hmm. um, we got a question about um, the demand for adoptable babies children and the kind of capitalist um, and economic conditions that surround the adoption industry and how that relates to drives the child welfare system. Can you talk a little bit about that? Again, I want to say I'm not an, I'm not an expert in, the, in that movement and I haven't you know, worked in, in, in those spaces. Really, everything I know about this comes from ad ad adoptees that I've talked to. I think it just, it, it speaks to the larger idea that I don't think the movement has really grappled with, with the idea of children being property and children not having rights. Um, and the idea that there, also the idea that there is a, it almost feels like something of a, a right to have children, whether you can biologically have them or not. I think that creates a lot of the issues with the adoption narrative. So I think we just start to really, really have to start challenging the adoption narrative, which I think is, I mean, we have challenges in the family policing space and getting people to understand what this movement is about, but I think the, and the myth of benevolence, but I think the adoption narrative and the myth of benevolence there is, is even greater. So, I mean, I think when it comes to thinking about how to build movements and coalesce movements, we really need to start having this all be part of, all be part of the conversation. Okay, we are coming up on time. Um, we have a few more minutes, but, I wanted to talk about vision and what the what what it could you know what the system could look like. So um, we talked a little bit about the pushback that you get when you hear uh, when you when you often pr present this idea that people say, well, what about worst case scenario? But what do you when you imagine a future without this system? What do families look like? What do families look like, and what do communities look like um, that can foster healthy, accountable children and families? Yeah, I, I think that's really important. I mean, I, I write in the book that abolition is fundamentally a, about hope. And you know, that comes from Mariam Kaba, who says hope is a discipline, hope is something we actively practice. But abolition for me is the belief that this world we wish to see is possible because the idea that it is impossible is just not something that we can accept. I think, and I think a lot of the hope for abolition for me, and I know for many others, comes from the idea of abolition democracy, which is a term coined by W.B. Du Bois and then later expanded by Angela Davis. But it's the idea that the abolition movement that we're in right now is not a modern abolition movement. It's the same abolition movement that's been happening in this country for hundreds of years now. Because the goals of the original abolition movement that began during chattel slavery were never achieved because ending slavery was part of that goal, but the real goal of that movement was liberation, full liberation, and we have not yet experienced that in society. So I think the hope comes from the fact that there's been hundreds of years of this work happening, and it's still happening all around us, and there's still so much to accomplish. I, I think I'll take this to a really big place, because it's the, where, where I try to think about all the time, like really what is the vision? In, in the book, um, Kristen and Maya and I talk about this as a limitation of the white imagination, that in so many ways we're socialized to think about what is possible 
in the confines of what we, we know and we've been socialized to think. So in the movement, we often talk about solutions as being things like universal basic income and child allowances and ways to get more resources to people. And, and those things are all necessary, but they're just, I would say, like intermediate solutions in the sense that we, we have this kind of limitation, this space where the problem is money, so then the solution is to give people more money. But actually the real problem is why we allow ourselves to exist in a society where people need this thing called money to eat and to live and to take care of their children. As, as Maya says, why is it always build wealth and never abolish capitalism? That's what we really need to be thinking about. The problem is that money is a thing that determines who has what and literally who, who dies on the street and who doesn't. So I mean, the vision is a society where not just child protective services and police don't exist, the vision of society is a society where money doesn't exist, where people have what they need. And in this, in the vision that you talk about, you also talk about what the role of government <clears throat> could be in a, and how we shift the role of government. Because right now, the role of government is punishment, it's post hoc, it's the back end. What does it look like in the future? What, is, what role does the government play in creating and supporting healthy families? That, that's again a, a tricky question in that there's like, that there's kind of the, the interim immediate thing and then what the long term role is. You know, I think in the, in the interim space, I often think about the more than two trillion dollars that the government found during COVID to provide to people as aid. You know, nobody knew COVID was happening. That money wasn't budgeted. It's not like people put that in the budget because they knew they were gonna have to come up with $2 trillion in aid to people. The government just found it when they needed to find it, which we see them do all the time. Like the entire economy is literally just in people's imagination, it doesn't exist. So starting there, but, but then there's like a, a value piece of it. You know, we talk about that $2 trillion that was given during COVID as aid. What if it wasn't aid? What if it's just what we expected of government to take care of its residents? I think that's the way that we need to start shifting things. The other problem related to that, which is both a government problem and a societal problem, so I wanna mention the societal part, is the way that we think right now about money. When, I, when people ask me what should, when, or what should happen to children who are really abused. And I talk about, you know, here in Texas, we give foster parents about $1,000 a month to take care of someone else's children. And I also say, what if we just gave that $1,000 a month to the mom who's struggling to meet her child's needs? Which is, seems incredibly simple, but people have said in multiple spaces to me, how do we know she's not gonna use that money for drugs? And that points to a societal problem that we have, which is facilitated by the government because that narrative comes from government narratives about black mothers going to the war on drugs and crack babies and welfare queens, all of that. We, so that's, the attitude's been shaped by the government, but we have to start reframing, reshaping, just rejecting that narrative. How do we know the foster parents not gonna use it for drugs? We don't, but that's how we've been socialized to think about poor mothers and particularly poor black mothers. So we have to reject these government narratives and start believing that people are, that people who need help should get the help that they need without, without punishment. The, the, the whole bootstrap man mentality needs to be abandoned. But we societally still are grasping onto that. Okay, I could ask a lot more things, but we are at time, and I think that's a great place to end. Thank you so much. Um, I thank you.